In the last video, I underpinned metaphysics with a brief history of the universe, which at this stage is to be taken with a grain of salt. We have not yet said anything that proves that a physical world exists, and all we have so far is the fact that there is something, and of what that something is, I merely stated what is considered true according to the experts that study this something world. The objectivist metaphysics can be laid out in three axiomatic concepts. An axiomatic concept is the identification of a primary fact of reality, which cannot be analyzed, i.e. reduced to other facts or broken into component parts. It is implicit in all facts and in all knowledge. It is the fundamentally given and directly perceived or experienced, which requires no proof or explanation, but on which all proof and explanation rest. Given that definition, objectivism's three axioms are existence exists, A is A, consciousness is conscious. You cannot reduce existence, identity, or consciousness to other facts or break them down into component parts. A newborn baby has no way of knowing these axiomatic concepts, neither do children, adolescents, and even some adults. Since we started physical history at the currently alleged beginning of time, let's also start metaphysics at the beginning. I do not mean to explore the history of metaphysical thought throughout mankind. I intend to properly start metaphysics at its beginning, the birth of a newborn human baby. This will be our baby and we will call him Nathan. When Nathan was first born just a moment ago, he arrived into a world that was already teeming with things. If we imagine Nathan was born to a Stone Age tribe, Nathan was still born to a world teeming with things that already existed long before, plus a few recent additions called tools. It doesn't matter where on the evolutionary tree we place Nathan. Three things remain a fact. Nathan is born to an existing world. Nathan is born to an existing world that is full of things. And Nathan is born sensing the existing world through an existing body that must act in accordance with its nature to survive this existing world. Newborn Nathan is born tabula rasa, meaning blank slate. The initial state of the human brain is genetically wired during gestation through a process of molecular brain regions which attract and repel neurons as they grow. This is like how a bacteria finds food or fungi lay roots, except it is an axon asymmetrically adding and removing growth structures in accordance to whether or not it is attracted or repelled at that area of the brain. The genetic structure of your brain is predetermined. However, chemotaxis does not predetermine what you will know. In this way, your brain structure is a consequence of evolution, but its contents are not. Before we go any further, it may be beneficial to briefly talk about a contrast between adult perspectives of metaphysics before examining the way in which a conceptless baby comes to know existence. The adult study of metaphysics divides at one main idea, the primacy of existence or the primacy of consciousness, that is, whether existence comes before consciousness or whether consciousness comes first. Throughout the history of human existence, whether the masses have thought this way or not, individuals were literally ruled by the primacy of consciousness. This manifested in the idea that the universe was created by a god of some non-physical consciousness. Contrast this with the objectivist metaphysics, that existence created consciousness, as consciousness is that which is aware of existence. This does not mean that the objectivist metaphysics is materialistic. The idea that consciousness comes first comes from Plato and is called idealism. The method by which to come to know idealism is through your consciousness, your mind, your spirit, and by ignoring your senses. The materialists are anti-idealists. They just flip the idea. Ignore your consciousness and only rely on the exterior world. They say that your consciousness is the byproduct of your senses and is predetermined by a predetermined evolutionary brain. They believe that you are driven by the environment and any thought that you have about free will is an illusion. The objectivist view is that your consciousness exists as a physical object and it exists without contradiction, i.e. as an identity in which it acts in accordance with its nature. Consciousness is that which is conscious of existence. A consciousness with nothing to be conscious of is a contradiction in terms. You must use your mind to know what exists outside you, and you must use your mind to know what contents exists inside your mind. From Galt's speech, that which you call free will is your mind's freedom to think or not. The only will you have, your only freedom, the choice that controls all the choices you make and determines your life and your character. Idealists believe that they can make existence non-existent by will. The materialists believe that their rationalizations prove that consciousness is unconscious. 
Objectivists know that you cannot use your conscious wishes or your rationalizations to prove that the world does or doesn't exist. The world proves that the world exists, and you must discover it. And to discover it, you must choose to focus on it. Choice is not chance. Volition is not an exception to the law of causality. It is a type of causation. We will address the topic of free will in an addendum video. So let's return to Nathan. The newborn's mind is a blank slate. His eyes cannot see color and his vision is blurry. His ears can hear every sound, but they are unable to distinguish words. His ability to move is nothing but random spasms and grasping to cling on to his mother. The brain is the only organ which is unfinished at birth, and thus every sensation is unrelated to every other at the start. The base of man's existence is sensual. At this stage, we could say that Nathan is aware of entities, but he cannot distinguish them from anything, as he has nothing to compare them to at this stage. In order to reach the ability to identify objects, Nathan will have to continue to passively observe reality. He must exist at this moment as an animal, relying on his emotional and mechanical mechanisms. When a face is made, he imitates the facial expression. Although the brain's output is mechanical at this cognitive stage, the input is driving strong neural connections. Neurons that fire together wire together. At this sensational age, a lot of neurons are firing together, and there is a lot of noise. Let's call it brain static. Despite all this brain static, i.e. random connections of unrelated sensations being integrated by the brain as if they were related, reality does exist, and the connections that link those properly observed existence grow larger than the spontaneous and accidental integrations. It's like an organized chaos at first, like trying to watch a scrambled television. There are clear distinctions between the outlines of people from the background, and a clear distinction between the noise of the people in the background static, but you cannot quite make out what you are experiencing. TV 27, between this is how a newborn first experiences its world. There are no words or relationships, just a chaos of things, and this chaos of sensory experiences drives neural connections that are haphazard. Nathan, by the age of three, will have three times as many neurons as an adult because of this chaos of interacting stimuli slash neural connections. This is why children at this age say the strangest things, their brains have made the loosest of connections that for one brief chaotic moment seem to make sense. I said we were going to put him in the microwave. That's what you said. Um, honey, no, no fish are not food. They're friends. Yeah. They're only friends. When the time comes, Nathan will be able to focus on these loose connections as the contents of his mind. He can help prune that connection by ignoring the false connections and continuing to focus on what is real. As there is limited room in the brain, the brain will clean up the mess automatically to make room for new connections. Nathan being required to choose which of the millions of sensations he is going to focus on is volitional, but the sensations he will receive while focusing on that entity are non-volitional. His eyes and brain have automatic functions, but his executive functioning can override that process. At this stage, everything that is novel is fascinating, and everything that is old is boring. One of the automatic functions of the brain is that it feels good to experience new things. It is an automatic function driven by the evolutionary fact that an animal that does not seek new options due to environmental changes either dies or gets stuck in a tree eating undigestible leaves. This natural curiosity is what drives implicit awareness of identity. The millions of sensations have been integrated into bundles of connections, and these regions turn individual sensations into percepts. If Nathan involuntarily gates at the edge of a table, Every ganglion receptive field that automatically activates when an edge is detected is activated together. Reality is full of edges. Some edges activate more ganglion receptive fields as some edges take up more retina space. Some edges are short, some wide, some thin. Along with each activation of the edge receptors is the activation of light intensity sensors, motion sensors, and color sensors. Nathan's brain starts to build strong connections based on the activation of sensations caused by entities, and after a certain point it becomes boring. It becomes boring because all of the connections between this edge ganglion receptor field is already strongly attached to that edge ganglion receptor field directly next to it, and only new connections flood the brain with dopamine. Being excited by the same old stimulus is a disability. Clive really only has less than 30 seconds memory, and sometimes it's as little as perhaps seven seconds. It's as little as a sentence. I've never seen a doctor the whole time. <gasps> oh, look, it's come. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs>
it also gets boring to be excited by the connections between edges of different lengths and then connections between edges and light intensity. Existence consistently reinforces the boring and also always provides the content to integrate in new dopamine-filled ways. Consciousness always responds by strengthening the cytoarchitecture it created in response to reality and its integration of many sensations into single percepts makes room for new connections to form. Once all the basic connections are linked, such as discovering the sensation from one eye can be integrated into monocular vision, and discovering that sensations from both eyes together integrate binocular vision, which gives depth, a new field of view, and the ability to focus on various things at various distances, Nathan will have reached the stage of identity. Nathan is now no longer a sensational animal, but a perceptual animal. He can never go back naturally. The fact of reality has driven a single neural connection into a strong bundle of fiber. Once seen, it can never be unseen. For example, you may be able to see some of this image. But after I show you the original, and then return to the first, you can see what was unseen, and you cannot see the first as you previously did. Now it is just a low threshold picture of two owls and a lady. Earlier I said the base of man's existence is sensual. We can now say that the base of man's knowledge is perceptual. The distinction between existence and knowledge requires percepts. Sensations are not retained by memory, and therefore to use senses as a base of knowledge would require you are within view of the thing you are trying to gain knowledge about. And that's it. You cannot have knowledge of a tree from the senses, except that you know, for the moment, that it is there. Any thought of color or texture would require perception. Perceptions are the connections of senses, and those connections are memories. By throwing objects over and over, infants are gaining muscle memory for throwing. The strong neural connections are the memories. The memories are the strong neural connections. However, it requires concepts to think about them, a stage at which Nathan has not yet reached. The connections the brain makes is driven by the physical entities in reality. The fact that things have a certain nature is what connects our brains to detect certain natures. The perception of length is caused by a row or column of retinal ganglion cells being activated by a thing of length. The perception of weight is caused by the activation of multiple touch receptors activated at once by a weighted object. The perception of depth is caused by the integration of both eyes sensing the same thing at once and the motor response to move the lenses. Once Nathan has discovered percepts, his constant interaction with them will automize the integration and retention of them. This integration cuts the millions of senses down to a perceptual unit. It is that unit formation that makes it simpler for the brain to retain information. After each of Nathan's individual senses are linked to themselves, and then those individual senses are linked together with each other, Nathan will never experience the world as a purely chaotic sense experience again. Nathan can now only detect groups of sensations as percepts. This unit formation, however, does not remove the millions of individual entities that cause the millions of senses to activate. The process of unit formation merely integrates a grouping of individual stimuli into one entity. When Nathan detects an edge, he detects the edge of an object. That object has edges all the way around it. The edges and non-edges have different colors and different textures. The integration of multiple senses together allows Nathan to be able to discover objects. This identification of an object is now the automatic, as the brain has connected in such a way that no sensation can activate without sparking a memory of a whole entity. Having automized the detection of objects has, again, not removed the millions of objects in the universe. Nathan, however, can no longer take them all in. Each and every sensation invokes a memory, and there's not enough mental working space to invoke every memory at once. By integrating neural connections into a bundle, one stimulus activates the whole bundle, and the bundle cannot fire two action potentials at the same time. That would violate the law of identity of an axon, so the amount of stimulation must be reduced due to the occupied neurons. This drives an important feature of human cognition, attention and focus. In order to survive, an animal needs to discover what sensations to ignore and which to focus on. It is focus that allows an infant to discover cause and effect. The object they have identified can be grasped, tasted, and visually tracked. When the child releases their grasp, it falls to the ground and makes a sound. Drop things and people pick them back up. Objects that fall out of sight come back into sight, having the same features the brain remembers. 
Children like Nathan discover that objects have a nature that is more than just edges, colors, textures, sizes, and tastes. They also have repeatable relationships with other objects. Smashing two build blocks together and hear a noise they don't make when apart. But smash one of those building blocks against a teddy and a much quieter, different noise is made. A pattern recognition becomes the new normal. The ability to focus on a few objects at a time while ignoring the rest allows the infant to continue their automizing of percepts. This again is not the materialistic behavioralist viewpoint that I am espousing. This is the objectivist view. The child has no choice in the sense that if he chooses to focus on the action, that his brain will encode the action based on the identities, which are based on the neurons that fire together, which are based on the sensations integrated as percepts. The child has a choice in whether or not he wants to focus. Focus and attention are in the same region of the brain as language, memory, perception. If you were to sever the temporal lobe of humans from the rest of the brain, you would have the human behavioralists pray for. If you sever the parietal lobe from the human brain, you'd get the idealist's ideal human. Both of them will leave you brain dead. Objectivism requires the whole brain. Let's summarize the physics then metaphysics of a small child. The brain begins as a blank slate that starts to form correlational connections caused by the myriad of sensations occurring at once. Neurons that fire together wire together. This wiring creates a metaphysical world which implicitly provides the child with the knowledge that there is a world out there which is made up of things. Those things exist in a certain way that make them similar and distinct from other things. This includes what those things do to other things, that those things can do things to you, that you can act on other things to make them do the thing they do, and that you can act in a way in which affects you, and that you have an identity that likes being affected in some ways and not others. A metaphysics of physics has now been formed in Nathan's brain, and now the child has reached a level of attentive focus, he can now have a choice in which objects and relationships he wishes to learn more about, which will lead us into epistemology, which will be part three of this series.